we wanted to give a special emphasis on tolerization. There's been a lot of interest around that area. There's a lot of hope and promise as to how it might be used in not just treating the disease, but solving it, AKA cure. Okay, so uh, what we'll try to do in the next 30 minutes is spend about 10 minutes on the basic uh, pathogenesis, how the disease occurs, and then we'll throw in tolerization and show how we hope that that will turn the whole process off. Okay, Did we- Did you say anything about an exam? There will be an exam. Wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> just saying, yeah. And participation. Where we can, we'll ask for audience participation, as is the you know tradition. So we might ask some of you to serve as various molecules or cells. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, first of all, some introductions. Dr. Scott Zamville. Uh, neurologist, immunologist, University of California, San Francisco. An expert dog, dog trainer. <laughs> An expert dog, dog trainer, yep. You know Dr. Larry Steinman, Stanford University. Also in the audience today is uh, Dr. Terry Smith, University of Michigan, who is quite an immunologist and endocrinologist, focuses on Graves' disease. Um, we know each other well. I'm Michael Yeaman. I'm at UCLA in immunology and infectious diseases. So, what starts an MO? Where does it begin and what is the basic pathogenesis? Scott and I have a little routine that we'll go through here to uh, help illustrate this. Scott will play the, a part of the T cell, okay? <laughs> And I will play the part of the antigen presenting cell, okay? Now before we actually put this into uh, real life animation, just a reminder up here of sort of the anatomy. On the right side of the board is the central nervous system, okay? Optic nerves, spinal cord, brain. Dividing the central nervous system from the periphery is the blood-brain barrier. We've illustrated it as a line of endothelial cells. It's more complicated than that, but for the time being, there is a way to keep things from the periphery from getting into the central nervous system, okay? And we're gonna call that the blood-brain barrier. In the periphery is the rest of the immune system that we will be talking about today. B cells that you know a lot about, T cells that you also know a lot about. B cells and T cells are lymphocytes. Everybody okay so far? We'll talk about the antigen, uh, the autoreactive T cell in just a moment. Lymphocytes and granulocytes are the two major types of white blood cells. Granulocytes include eosinophils, neutrophils, macrophages. Macrophages, again, not exactly a granulocyte, but for, the, for today we'll consider them a type of granulocyte. <clears throat> These are the guys that cause inflammation. These are the guys that control inflammation. We okay so far? This is complement. Complement is a collection of 20-ish or so proteins that are made by the liver and they act in a domino effect. When the first one binds and activates, it causes the next one. You know, if C1 binds and activates, it causes C2 to bind and activate, which causes C3 and two, all the way through C9. And when C9, complement protein 9, binds to a cell, it punctures the cell and ultimately kills it. So when complement fixes on an astrocyte, the astrocyte will be killed. Complement will only fix on the astrocyte if an antibody has bound to the astrocyte. And that antibody is anti aquaporin 4 Okay, good. So we're all set. Now this one we're calling D, a dendritic cell. 
Dendritic cell is one type of antigen presenting cell. Okay, and now we're gonna begin our animation. You ready? Okay. An antigen presenting cell wanders through the body. It's looking, it's detecting, it's asking, is this normal? Is that normal? Is this normal? So far everything's looking good. It's all good, it's fine. You know, sorry, may I? Sure. <laughs> you know, as an antigen presenting cell, I'm seeing this as maybe not normal. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and an antigen presenting cell takes a piece of this and processes it and displays it on its surface. And the antigen presenting cell takes that information back to a lymph node where, first of all, you are the T cell, where a T cell is present. And the antigen presenting cell and the T cell have a molecular handshake. And the first thing is, you know, T cell, I saw something out there that I don't think is normal. And the T cell says, I am now get excited. I get turned on, basically, and activated, in other words, sorry. <laughs> Appropriate terminology here. <laughs> and if I happen to be that one, the autoreactive T cell, that's the one that we worry about because that one can actually communicate with the next cell along the pathway. So let's just uh, update our scoreboard over here. So the dendritic cell, in the case of NMO, has somehow made its way into the central nervous system and has said, you know, on this astrocyte is this stuff called aquaporin-4. And for some reason, this dendritic cell, this antigen-presenting cell, sees that as abnormal. It may be that the protein is abnormal. It may be that the antigen-presenting cell has mistakenly seen it as abnormal. But either way, it brings it back out, shows it to the T cell, and now the T cell becomes autoreactive to aquaporin-4. So now we have this guy. He's in black, right? Bad guys are in black. Autoreactive T cells are now present in the immune system. Scott? So have we made an antibody yet? Have B cells even been involved yet? No. Okay, so what is Scott doing now? We don't know, but I'm looking. I'm looking for another cell type. The one that I communicate with, which is B cell, exactly. And so that's the one that makes the antibody when it becomes a plasma cell. This is T autoreactive. T stands for thymus, but really it stands for teacher because the T teaches the B cell what to do. The B cell can't do it on its own. It needs signals from this one, this guy here. Who would like to be the B cell? Would you like to be the B cell? Okay, there you go, B cell. Remember there was a great quote from Shakespeare, to be or not to be, and you chose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, B. So, I come up to you. I'm the T cell. I say hello to you. We shake hands. The B cell becomes activated in some way. And excited. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> and then what happens with that B cell? Once they are together with the T cell and the B cell together, the T and the B cell, they speak to each other. It's an autoreactive T cell that sees aquaporin-4, found the B cell that sees aquaporin-4. That's a special B cell. And that's the one, when it becomes activated, then what we use a term called differentiate, becomes a plasma cell to secrete an antibody. But it may also cross mm -hmm. over. Move into the blood, through the blood-brain barrier here. And, and the T cell, what we need now is not so much a cell 
we need a molecule. We're missing our antibody. We're missing but. our antibody. Okay, so do we need an antibody? We need an antibody. Michelle, can you be the antibody? <laughs> okay, the antibody is like this. So the T is me, the antibody has two arms, but you can keep your arms in like that. Sure, yep. Because remember, he, he has the aquaporin for. You, yes, <laughs> you are the aquaporin for specific antibody. So you search around, and you're initially outside the central nervous system, but something happens that permits Michelle, the antibody, the aquaporin for specific antibody, to come right through, come back, and then, now, no, you're good. You're, you're good, good out there? You're good. That's right, because normally you wouldn't want to necessarily go there. It wouldn't necessarily want to go into the central nervous system. It's because the B cell has already, has arrived in the central nervous system. Now you come over and you can stand on this side next to the astrocyte. We needed an antibody. Oh, <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. Do you want to take over? Sure. With the, the liver produce these yes. elements? You go. <laughs> okay. So in your bloodstream right now are all the pieces to the complement cascade. It's only when an antibody binds to an astrocyte that triggers complement to fix on that antibody astrocyte combination. So because of this binding, now a bunch of complement makes its way through the periphery into the blood brain, through the blood-brain barrier, into the central nervous system, and fixes on the antibody that's bound to the astrocyte. What happens to the astrocyte? Yep, it just goes away. When astrocytes go away, what happens to myelin? And there's also a bunch of inflammation and inflammatory mediators that ask, dying astrocytes do not go quietly. They send out chemokines, and Scott will tell you about what happens. So you learned about granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and over there you see macrophages. They're in the periphery, but they are also involved in the inflammatory response, and in NMO, we know that neutrophils are present in the lesions, and they're involved in the destructive process. So they will actually enter, and it won't be just this one alone, but all three will traverse the blood-brain barrier and end up right here next to the astrocyte. So there are multiple hits on the astrocyte. The astrocyte here, a whole it was punctured with the complement. That also releases molecules, chemicals that attract here, the complement itself and what, what's released, and the neutrophils come in. And along with that, another one of the granulocytes, the eosinophil. A little bit different function in terms of what it does than the neutrophil. And some of these cells come through as well, or they, for this type of cell, may arise in the nervous system too. So it can be on the site as well. And they're involved in creating and damage, but may also be involved in some of the recovery that can occur. So let's just make sure we're all on the same speed here. Astrocytes are in the periphery or the central nervous system? Okay. Because a T cell was presented an antigen by an antigen presenting cell that told it aquaporin 4 is not normal, please react to it. The T cell communicated to the B cell, the B cell made antibody that crossed the blood brain barrier and stuck to the astrocyte, complemented, activated on that process that led to injury of the astrocyte and signals that drew all of these inflammatory cells into the central nervous system. We good with that? I'm not good with that. 
please. So, two or three times I've heard that first it was the dendritic cell, and then it was Dr. Yeaman going up to you, and then there's something irregular here. So, and the words that came out, remember, we're telling you in words, but what's happening is really with molecules, that there's something wrong about aquaporin-4. So it turns out, and people have done the experiment, there's actually nothing wrong with aquaporin-4 in a person who has NMO. They've sequenced aquaporin-4. It's no different than aquaporin-4 in people who don't have NMO. So what's going on? But Scott, when he gave his talk to the scientists yesterday, made a really important observation that the whole reason we have all this machinery is uh, not to cause uh, very bad disease, but it's to protect us largely from viruses and bacteria. So it turns out that there's a certain bacteria which has a sequence in it that resembles very much aquaporin-4. Well, that would be bad if it's a, it actually happens to be a bacteria that can cause a lot of trouble sometimes. So it would be very bad if every time the immune system saw that bacteria that they recognized that chunk of it that looks like aquaporin-4. It would be uh, a terrible situation. But the way that dendritic cell recognizes a bacteria, it, one person may see this chunk of that bacteria that has nothing whatsoever to do with aquaporin-4. It's just bad, uh, it's a bad bacteria and the dendritic cell sees it. But for individuals with NMO, the dendritic cell decides to feast, to eat, to present that part of this bacteria that looks very much like aquaporin-4. And that's where the whole mess starts. And it turns out that the chromosome that uh, makes a protein that tells the dendritic cell where to fight the bacteria is this famous area on chromosome 6 that Michael was talking about just before uh, Jacinta got on the stage. So I didn't like that part of the talk. I think that uh, autoimmunity exists because we're making, our bodies are making sometimes a mistaken identity. It happens all the time, mistaken identity. But in this case, it has terrible consequences because the mistake is in a portion of the molecule that has, let's say, the same fingerprint as aquaporin-4. So uh, there's nothing wrong with aquaporin-4. It's just that in some individuals, their immune system mistakes it for something that you'd want to fight. And that causes a terrible cross-reaction. They have a, a nice term in immunology, molecular mimicry. So there's portions of self, in this case the water channel, that resemble, in the case that Scott showed, really greatly a piece of Clostridia perfringens. So we don't, we don't know <laughs> whether molecular mimicry is involved in NMO. All of you, most of you in here, 95% of all humans have the bacterium that Scott was talking about. And of course, not all of us have NMO. So there's a big difference between having that bacterium and having the disease. There so, may be a thousand steps involved in the process, and that could be one key link, because we all have Clostridia, Clostridium perfringens in our own gut. But people ask the question about diet. And when you're in the clinic, you ask your physician, is diet important? And the answer is yes. And then you say, how? And we say, we don't know. Because we don't know at this point. So we are all involved in studies to try and figure out whether one bacteria goes up and another one goes down. And maybe the imbalance plays a factor. And if it's the right bacteria, it may set off these two cells together. But, but remember, Michael also said that 
it's like one of those combination locks. Many things have to go wrong in sequence or in parallel, but they have to go wrong. So you may be one of those people that shares one of those chromosome six genes with somebody who has NMO. But you gotta have a lot of other things uh, unfortunately lined up for the uh, disease to happen. But um, I, I like to uh, tell people that their autoimmune disease is just one of these mistaken identity cases. How many immunologists buy the explanation I give? I'd say about two-thirds. The rest have these really, in my opinion, cockamamie uh, stories about how the immune system has a special way of telling what is self and what is non-self. The immune system, uh, if you looked at the sequences Scott showed in his lecture yesterday, the immune system could not tell the difference between that stretch of Clostridia and that stretch of aquaporin-4. It's the same thing. So that brings us to tolerization, right? There's a lot of possible ways that the disease may begin, but now let's talk and focus on how to end it. Autoreactive T cells are one type of T cell, but there is another type, and that is the T regulatory cell. And there are also other types of B cells, like the B regulatory cell. And so Scott will give us some more detail in just a second, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Antigen-presenting cell shows to a T cell that aquaporin-4 is either unusual or mistaken. T cell becomes an autoreactive T cell that teaches other cells to react to aquaporin-4. One of those is a B cell that makes antibody. Antibody passes through the blood-brain barrier and binds to astrocytes. Astrocytes bound with antibody fix complement. Complement produces signals that draw in inflammatory cells. If we could stop this process, if we could re-educate the immune system, the T cells, that aquaporin-4 is not a bad guy. Couldn't we stop all of this? That's what tolerization is. So Scott, maybe you could just offer a couple of ways that we can induce more T regulatory cells or reteach them to turn this guy off. So first of all, you have now all passed with flying colors. You all got A pluses <laughs> in immunology 101. Now we're into advanced immunology, but it's not that, not that complicated. When we study patients' blood with NMO and looked at their T cells to aquaporin-4, yes, we found with patients that had NMO that they have T cells, and they are T cells that are autoreactive in this case, this one, to aquaporin-4. They make chemicals that are not good. Pro-inflammatory cytokines is the immunology term. But in the normals, the healthy controls, or family members um, that we had. They also, I have T cells to aquaporin-4. Those of us that don't have NMO have aquaporin-4 specific T cells. They exist and they're not, somehow they're not autoreactive in the sense that they're causing damage. They're, they're auto-specific for aquaporin-4. They're kept in check. REG stands for regulatory cell. And so they control the regulatory response to aquaporin-4 specific T cells. So you do have them, just like we have T cells to other autoantigens in our thyroid or to our tissue and collagen. And similarly, not only the T cell response, but there's also now we recognize a regulatory B cell component as well. And together, they really do control this cell type here. So their goal is to keep this one down here and be up here. And the balance that we have in NMO somehow may be switched. So there's several different ways to turn up the regulatory T cells or B cells. 
Dr. Steinman's working on an approach where a piece of DNA that encodes aquaporin-4 is injected into muscle or other tissue and constantly secretes a little bit of aquaporin-4 so that when the antigen presenting cell wanders around, it's already seen so much of it that it just says, yeah, you know, okay, that's fine. I've seen that before. And doesn't react to it. Larry, do you want to? Yeah. So that, that's the idea. So uh, this uh, disease, NMO, uh, we should be able to get rid of aquaporin-4 antibodies in a perfect world someday and leave the rest of your immune system alone. And even before we do something fancy like what we just told you about, a piece of DNA putting out a little of aquaporin-4, I just throw this out. Nobody's ever achieved it. But an antibody is real specific. An antibody to influenza binds the influenza virus. It doesn't bind the hepatitis virus. It binds influenza. An, an antibody to aquaporin-4 binds aquaporin-4. It might bind the piece that looks like Scott's bacteria. But isn't it amazing to you, with all of the uh, geniuses at Jet Propulsion Lab and other places, that we just can't make a column, instead of doing a plasmapheresis and getting rid of all your immunoglobulin, why can't we just make a column, pass your plasma through the column, have the column have aquaporin-4 stuck on it, your aquaporin-4 binds, the aquaporin-4 antibody binds to the aquaporin-4 and the rest of your plasma passes through. And you do this every once in a while, just you go and listen to some nice music and you get plasma for east and you just get rid of your aquaporin-4 antibodies. Why not? Yeah. Why not? So it's, it's doable. Uh, somebody's got to do it. But these are the kinds of things that uh, happen real slowly because uh, of a variety of reasons. But there's so many ways. There's these fancy ways and there could be what I would call brute force ways. But we've got smart enough people around who if we put enough uh, engineers on the problem, these would be chemical engineers, that could be solved. It's never been done yet successfully. I don't know why, but so I ask myself. There's a couple of other ways that we might tolerize. One of them you heard about from OPEXA Therapeutics and related companies where cells, the autoreactive T cells are taken from your body, grown up in the laboratory, acted on so that they begin to die, and then put back into you. So that now the immune system says, you know, I've seen that autoreactive T cell, I don't like it, and I'm gonna kill it and anything in the future that looks like it. Meaning it's gonna kill the cells that can potentially cause disease. And if we can teach the immune system to do that permanently, we turn off the disease permanently. A vaccine. A vaccine. Okay, we have come to the end of our time. We have a couple of questions, please. Well, I, there's several different ways to respond to that, but let me just address the first one. Autoreactive T cells to aquaporin-4 are probably one of the types of autoreactive T cells that cause disease. But let's take MOG positive NMO, for instance. There are autoreactive T cells to that protein also. And one of the great things about a tolerization approach is that the cells that come from a person that are contributing to disease can be identified and all of the types that are promoting disease can be placed into that cocktail vaccine and used to vaccinate against a bunch of different antigens. But as far as titer is concerned, in some people on treatment, the titer wanes. In others, it stays up even though there's improved symptoms. We don't understand the relationship between antibody and disease yet, except for one possibility that remains to be determined and that is there may be good antibodies also. We've talked about the bad antibodies here. It is likely that there are beneficial antibodies that compete with the bad antibody. And so maybe if those go up, it's actually a good thing. So we just don't understand enough about the titer yet. But I think your, your question cuts 
uh, to the very heart of the matter. So if we're saying that, and I've said it a lot of times, this is the disease because you're making a bad response to aquaporin 4, let's forget about the 20% who are always negative to that. But let's take the people who are positive. If you were to take those people and reduce their anti-aquaporin 4 antibody to zero, they should get better. If they don't, then we really have to go back to the drawing board. If we just bring it down a little bit, we may be missing. Antibodies have a, a variety of characteristics. There are really strong binders and really weak binders. And uh, those fluctuations that don't exactly correlate with whether you got better or not may just be picking up a whole spectrum. So we really have to get, uh, again, much more sophisticated. We already have very sophisticated ways of doing that NMOIG test, but now we have to look at what part of the aquaporin-4 are they binding, what is their uh, actual binding strength, or, and uh, until we get those answers, you would think that we would be standing up here knowing all those answers. The field does not. Don't okay, be one. disappointed, though, that the antibody may not correlate. It's, it's very complicated, not only for NMO, but even in rheumatoid arthritis, where we follow rheumatoid factor and treat with rituxan as well. And patients improve, and the rheumatoid factor takes longer to come down. OK, one last question. question. Is there a way that you can check the health of your T regulator cells? I mean, now. That's a great question, and it's one of the biomarkers that we're looking at. Not just antibody, but how many autoreactive T cells do you have that target aquaporin 4? How many regulatory T cells do you have that turn down the autoreactive T cells? What that balance might be. Those are great examples of biomarkers that we're looking into. Okay, thank you very much. We really appreciate all of your time and questions.